Hello and welcome to this COVID-19 update for December 19th, 2021. My name is Lindsay and I'm a pharmacist from British Columbia, Canada. Today, I will be speaking with you about the current pandemic in Canada and around the world. I want to specify that the information that I have is correct as of today's date. The objective of today's talk is to discuss a little bit about Omicron and what that means for the current pandemic. I'm also going to give you some tools and some resources that you can use over the holidays to help protect yourself and your family. I want people to understand that there is a lot that we can do. There is not a reason for us to despair and think that all is lost. We have the tools available to combat this pandemic, to protect ourselves and our families from this virus and in making good choices and protecting ourselves with the tools that we have, we can keep ourselves and our families safe. If you do have questions about Omicron or about anything about the pandemic, please do not hesitate to ask. I will be looking in the description of this video, trying to answer your questions and even calm your fears as much as possible. Being fearful and stressed right now is not good for our health. It does not help us combat the virus and it will not help us get through this winter, which is why I released a video yesterday on seasonal depression, because I do think that there is a lot of mental health that is being compromised right now. And we really do need to pay attention to that just as much as anything else right now. Okay, so let's have a look at the data that we have to date. So before we look specifically at Omicron, let's look at the global situation of the pandemic. This is our world in data. I've chosen a few countries here for us to have a quick look at. Look at the almost vertical growth in cases in Denmark, United Kingdom, France, Canada. The United States, you can see, had flattened and not gone down for some time, and now they are experiencing an uptick. There has been an incredibly difficult Delta wave in many parts of the United States. Many healthcare workers have quit. They are dealing with very large volumes of COVID-19 patients in their hospitals. And now they have this wave of Omicron that is spreading quickly. Canada also starting to see a very quick uptick, especially in the province of Ontario. However, almost every province is experiencing this to some degree as Omicron spreads throughout the country. Keep in mind that these are case counts and with the original strain of the virus, we know that case counts were maybe 10 to 20 times lower than actual the actual number of cases. And I don't know what that will be with Omicron, but I suspect that these case counts will be a very large underestimation of the actual number of cases especially because we are seeing some regions in Canada where testing is already becoming more and more difficult. We are seeing long lineups and things like contact tracing are going to have to be prioritized for specific groups because of the sheer volume of cases that we are seeing. The data that I'm about to share with you is not my own data. This is some excellent work that has been brought to us by the BC COVID-19 modeling group. In the description of this video, I will give you a link to watch the full presentation of this data. This data was presented on December 8th. It is available to the public. The presentation is excellent. I will not do it justice. I strongly urge you to go and listen to this presentation if you are really interested in hearing some credible information about where this is going and why we are in the situation that we're in. They also explain Omicron just beautifully. So if you're interested in that, I would recommend you have a look. So in British Columbia, this is the current state of the pandemic. Now, if you do not live in British Columbia, this will still pertain to you in a moment. So just hang in there. I'm just going to give you a bit of a lay of the land of what's been going on in our province. So case rates before Omicron were continuing to decline slowly. We were starting to see a bit of improvement. We have 81% of all people vaccinated children under the age of, well between 5 and 11 were starting to be able to be vaccinated. 84% of people were partially vaccinated. So these are very good 
vaccination rates in our province. And we were starting to see an improvement in numbers, even though we were heading into winter, winter, even though the Delta variant was dominant and continues to be. Communities that are highly vaccinated have much lower COVID rates. This was a pandemic largely of the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated are the people that we were seeing in hospitals with severe disease and death. So we were starting to really see the effect, the impact of vaccination in our province. Omicron, a new variant of concern, has spread rapidly across the globe. Here we will discuss what we know and don't know about the potential impact of Omicron. Omicron is highly transmissible, which is why we're seeing this rapid spread. However, all is not lost. The tools that we have before still work. However, we need to be more cautious and more diligent about using these tools. So getting vaccinated, vaccinations still protect against severe disease. They do somewhat still protect against infection. Getting vaccinated is something that you can still do and it can still have a good impact. Even one dose after about two weeks gives you some protection and it's better than nothing. It is not too late to get vaccinated. Wearing a tight fitting mask, preferably a two or three layer mask or an N95 mask if you have access to that. Some people have also even recommended if you don't have that, you could wear a surgical mask with a cloth mask over top. The extra layers helps to provide more protection. Improving ventilation indoors, opening the windows, opening the doors, using a HEPA air filter that I've spoken about before, this can all help to reduce the viral load. Avoiding large indoor gatherings here in British Columbia, there's a public health order now not to have any indoor gatherings with people who are unvaccinated. And then also improving testing and contact tracing, access to rap rapid tests, is part of that and I will speak about that in a few moments. The severity of Omicron is unknown. There has been a lot of information in the media and on different YouTube channels about how this virus is more mild. And though this virus does look more mild in places like South Africa, that does not mean that it is going to be more mild in other places in the world. It is way too early to say that this is more mild. And I will explain that in the coming moments. But I want to caution everyone, we do not know if this is more mild. The big concern here is that an exponential rise in cases is eventually going to overwhelm hospitals. Imagine if everyone in Canada got influenza within about three weeks of each other. If everyone gets this variant at the same time, we still have millions of people who are unvaccinated. We are going to see hospitals overwhelmed, hospitals that are still dealing with COVID-19 patients from the Delta variant that is dominant in most communities right now. So restrictions, precautions that we are taking are not only to protect ourselves and our communities, but they are to preserve access to hospitals. Let's talk about Omicron. So Omicron is now designated as a variant of concern. Why? First of all, it has more mutations than other variants. I'm going to explain this graph to you in a moment. Many of the mutations, around 30, are in the spike protein itself, including several key mutations that have to do with the binding of the virus to cells in order to enter cells and the binding of antibodies to the spike protein. That's why we are seeing people who have previously been infected be infected again with Omicron in different places in the world. So in this graph here, if you look at the very center of the graph, point zero is where the original Wuhan virus is. And every ring here, I believe, indicates two mutations. So as we branch out, you can start to see where alpha started and where it progressively had different variants of itself. You can see beta. You can see that Delta has had so many different changes on its own, but then look at Omicron. Omicron does not look at all like Beta, Alpha, or Delta. Omicron has gone, I believe it's about 50 strains out, and it is all on its own. It does not look at all like the others. And this is where the big concern is. This is also where the idea originated 
that this must have come maybe from an immunocompromised person who was housing the virus over a prolonged period of time. We've seen this in the literature and was able to produce multiple variants during that time. This has not been proven, but we'll discuss that a little bit more. Okay, so here is a visual image of the spike protein itself. There are key mutations in the spike protein that shape Omicron. If you look between number one here and number six, this is what they call the interface for where the spike protein latches on to the ACE2 receptor and gets into cells. In this part alone of the spike protein, there are multiple mutations. These mutations are possibly allowing the spike protein to get into cells easier and also evade antibodies. So when the antibodies come to latch on to this part of the spike protein, they may be having more difficulty. If you look at zones two and three, there have been some deletions in this part of the spike protein. This is the part of the spike protein that led to them to being able to flag this as a variant because it came up as a deletion on the PCR tests. So that's how they discovered this variant. And there's more information about that in the actual presentation. You can also look at the article from the Financial Times where this was cited. There's a lot of information about the specific mutations and changes on the Omicron variant that we are seeing. Where did Omicron come from? We don't know, but we can tell that Omicron is different from other variants of concern. Omicron did not arise by just a simple mutation from another variant of concern or by combining itself with another variant. This Omicron is its own beast, essentially. While the rapid spread of Omicron was first reported in South Africa, many other nations had cases in early November, making its exact origin unknown. And we may never know exactly where Omicron came from. Omicron bears several signatures common to cases where SARS-CoV-2 have spent an extended period with an immunocompromised individual. This is what I was alluding to earlier. It has a higher than expected number of mutations. The high density of mutations specifically in the spike protein. It appears distantly related to current viruses and more closely related to viruses at the time of infection. Because Omicron is so different, we have less knowledge about its impacts, including its severity. How fast will Omicron spread in Canada? We do not know. Canada has an older population than places like South Africa. Canada always also has a very high vaccination rate. There are fewer South Africans than Canadians that have been fully vaccinated, 25% versus 76% of the entire population in Canada. More South Africans have had COVID-19, around 40%, accounting for 3 million known cases, and probably eightfold are, have been underreported. Globally, many fully vaccinated travelers have caught Omicron, and this has been, vac this has been documented. Anecdotal evidence of rapid airborne transmission between fully vaccinated participants at gatherings has been documented and we've seen this people who have attended Christmas parties with only fully vaccinated individuals and we have seen vaccinated individuals be infected the longer we have rapid growth the longer we allow this variant to spread through people especially who are unvaccinated the more likelihood of more variants there is a substantial risk of spreading Canada, even among the vaccinated. And this is what has epidemiologists and scientists extremely concerned right now because of our limited capacity in healthcare and because of the responsibility that public health officials have to try to protect people and keep them healthy and stop them from getting severe disease, if at all preventable. Our best protection against Omicron is to use the tools that we've already learned. Get vaccinated. Wear tight-fitting masks, avoid large gatherings, isolate when sick, improve ventilation, increase testing, and trace contacts to limit the spread. Dr. Raywat Dianandan is an epidemiologist that I've had on the channel more than once, and he posted this this week, and I think it was worth sharing. Your reminder that the COVID Omicron crisis 
is one of population risk, not of individual risk. Most people, even unvaccinated, will get away with mild symptoms, we hope. But at the population level, this can be stultifying if too many get sick at once. When we think about Omicron, when we think about how rapidly it is able to transmit, we need to think about population risk and not just our own individual risk. A quick update on pediatric vaccinations. You may have seen my interview with Dr. Jacqueline Wong about questions surrounding pediatric vaccinations. Many have found it to be helpful, and I would encourage you to check that out if you can. The CDC released an update from the VAERS database regarding myocarditis. We now have 7.1 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine that have gone out to children ages 5 to 11 in the United States. 5.1 million of those were first doses and 2 million were second doses. Out of these 7.1 million doses, we have 14 reports of myocarditis. Eight reports met CDC working case definitions for myocarditis, four males, four females. After dose one, two cases. After dose two, six cases. In the six reports with known outcomes, five have fully recovered. All of the cases reported were mild. And thank you to Unambiguous Science for providing us with this infographic. You can go to unambiguousscience.com and they have a great website with different infographics about the COVID-19 pandemic that are very, very helpful. Rapid antigen tests. I've been involved in advocacy for rapid antigen tests for quite some time now, and I'm happy to see that these are slowly being given out across Canada and hopefully in British Columbia in January. Unambiguous Science has provided a resource about how to use these rapid tests. And one thing that I wanted to point out for you, although these rapid tests are usually quite accurate, they are very time sensitive. And so it's recommended that if you are using a rapid test, say to go to an event, that you use a rapid test that morning, and then another one, maybe an hour or two before the event. Taking a rapid test the day before does not guarantee that the next day you will not be infectious and not able to transmit the virus to someone else. We also know that you can spread this virus if you are asymptomatic. And so a rapid test does help to give you a bit more confidence when you are going to some type of event. Five ways to fight an airborne virus. A reminder that SARS-CoV-2 is airborne. It's officially airborne now. <laughs> it's been airborne the whole time, but now people are finally starting to accept this. So there's a lot that we can do. Wear high quality masks like an N95 when indoors or even, like I said earlier, a surgical mask with a cloth mask over top or a two to three layer mask. And I've said it before, you can use like a paper towel filter inside a cloth mask if that's all you have. And it's really better than just the one layer. Open windows and doors where possible. Use a CO2 monitor to assess ventilation. Sometimes these can be acquired at a cost that is not very expensive online. Use a HEPA filter. I use one of these in my home whenever anyone is coming over that does not live in this household. It's always running and it will help to reduce the viral load. And avoid eating indoors with people that are not from your household. Try eating outdoors or doing activities outdoors because we know that outdoors is much safer than indoors when it comes to transmitting the virus and lowering the viral load that someone is exposed to. All the resources, links, Everything that I've discussed here and more will be in the description of this video. If you have questions about Omicron or about the COVID-19 pandemic, how to protect yourself, how to protect your family, please leave your questions or comments in the description of this video. And I will do my best to get back to you with credible information that you can apply to keep you and your family safe this holiday season. So I hope that that helps you to understand a little bit more of what we're dealing with with Omicron in the next weeks and months. We need to understand that we do have tools available to help protect ourselves. We do have reason to hope. Take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.